Hello, welcome to Cafe Snacks. Today you are having both 14th and 15th current happenings in one section. So let us go on to the most important current happenings for UPSC SSC and other state administrative examinations. It is online and this is Sham here. Let us move on to the first discussion. There is a news article titled Foreign Funds and NGOs. This is regarding the FCRA, that is the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of 2010. And what are the recent amendments that has happened to the FCRA or done by the present government? As per the syllabus, in the mains it is in Indian Polity and mains it comes in GS Paper 2. Sorry, in prelims it is in Indian Polity and mains it is a part of GS Paper 2. Now, what is the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of 2010? It is a rule framed under a particular context in order to regulate the receipt and usage of foreign contribution by non-governmental organizations. So it focuses on NGOs in India and since the act is internal security legislation despite being a law related to financial legislation. So this particular act has a more weightage to internal security legislation processes. And it falls into the purview of Home Ministry. And that's the reason why it is under the jurisdiction of Home Ministry and not Reserve Bank of India. That is to be remembered. Now, what are the scope and objectives of FCRA? The intent of this act is to prevent foreign contribution or foreign hospitality for any activity that is detrimental to national interest or civilian interest. And also, it has a very wide scope and is applicable to a natural person body corporate all other types of Indian entities whether they are incorporated or not and as well as to NRIs and overseas branches subsidiaries of Indian companies and other entities formed on registered in India and also it is implemented by the Ministry of Home Affairs Government of India now in order to achieve the above objective the act does the following that is, it prohibits acceptance and usage of foreign contribution or foreign hospitality by a certain specified categories of persons, such as a candidate for election, judge, journalist, columnist, newspaper publications, cartoonist, and others. And also, it regulates the info to and usage of foreign contribution by NGOs by prescribing a mechanism to accept, use, and report the usage of say. So what is foreign contribution? It defines foreign contribution to include currency, article, other than gift for personal use and securities received from foreign source. And while foreign hospitality refers to any offer from a foreign source, that is to provide foreign travel, boarding, lodging, transportation or medical treatment cost. Now regarding the acceptance of foreign funds, the Act permits only NGOs having a definite cultural, economic, educational, religious or social program to accept foreign contribution that too after such NGOs either obtain a certificate of registration or prior permission under the Act. So there need to be a certificate of registration or prior permission in order to take in foreign contributions. What are the clarifications that Ministry of Home Affairs has made on the exemption from FCRA provisions? So what are they? Let us look into that. The clarification came in response to a report in these columns on Saturday. So this is taken from the Hindu article. So that is the reason why these columns on Saturday and headlined questions over FCRA note for PM cares. So it is regarding the PM care fund. And according to the Ministry, Parliament had given powers to exempt any association or organization not being a political party from provisions on receiving contributions under the FCRA. So, Parliament has given exemption regarding the association or organization not being a political party. It is exempted from the provisions of FCRA. And using these powers, the Centre had issued an order in June 2011 under which the Prime Minister's National Relief Fund was exempted from all FCRA provisions. So that means Prime Minister's National Relief Fund can accept foreign contributions. 
and also similarly the prime minister's citizen assistance and relief in emergency situations fund that is pm cares fund was granted exemptions through a central government order that is dated march 28 2020 and six other organizations that is including the overseas india development foundation and bharat kavir have been extended similar fcri exemptions a vidya certificate notification dated 1st july 2011 the central government has made it clear that all such entities which were created by a central act or a state act and also compulsorily audited by cag that is controller and auditor general from all provisions of fcri so these particular central government agencies that is created by central act or state act and also compulsorily audited by cag will be exempted from the provisions of fcri and this exemption category was further expanded by a january 30 2020 gazette notification that exempted entities created by central or state government orders or any entity fully controlled and owned by the central or state governments from fcri recruitment and audited by the cag so that's all about that particular news let us move on to the next news the news is titled oxford vaccine trials to resume in uk and we are going to discuss the phase 3 trial and how it is complicated the syllabus as per the prelims it comes in science and technology and the topic is phases of vaccine trial the process so you need to understand vaccine and the vaccination processes and the trials that are undergone in order to make a vaccine legibly available to everyone so vaccines must undergo three phases of clinical trials in humans before they can be licensed for commercial distribution so phase 1 it is a clinical trial it is a very small number of healthy volunteer trial and which receive the vaccine under carefully monitored conditions so this small number of people will receive vaccine at a very carefully monitored condition to test the immune response at different doses and to identify potential side effects caused by the vaccine so the phase 1 is regarding a small group of healthy volunteers and what about phase 2 phase 2 there is a large group of healthy volunteers and they receive the vaccine to test whether it works by checking for signs of expected immune response at a therapeutic dose so a therapeutic dose will be given to check whether there is an expected immune response and also here too the potential side effects are explored the phase 3 is the most important and the difficult part of vaccine trials that is there is a much larger groups sometimes it can be across different countries they can receive the vaccine or a control such as a placebo or already licensed vaccine that means there will be a particular group and that group will be receiving the vaccine and there will be another large group that will be receiving the control and at last you need to identify whether the vaccine is much more effective than the control or the placebo and the comparisons between what happens to the individuals who receive the vaccine and what happens to those who receive the control or the placebo allow scientists to determine the vaccine safety and efficacy and the randomization of who receives the vaccine and who receives the placebo helps ensure that any differences that arise between the two groups are due to the vaccine so that's it and you need to understand about phase 3 what happens if phase 3 is successful the researchers will apply to regulatory bodies across the world to get permission to manufacture and distribute the vaccine even after a vaccine starts undergoing commercial distribution monitoring of its safety and effectiveness continue now regarding the urgency of covid-19 requires we need to understand the innovative processes that it requires one approach to speed up testing of vaccine is through adaptive trials so they are speaking about adaptive trial what are they these particular trials are something that are tweaked as they go usually in vaccine trial researchers will write a plan and they will stick to it through the entire course of the trial because of the expense that is involved in making changes and however by making changes in response to new findings things move much faster that is adaptive trial so as you go on requiring to the responses that you receive from the group of individuals on whom the vaccine is tested you need to change the vaccine trials accordingly that is adaptive trials and that will really help in achieving safety and efficacy 
and regarding the compressing the testing phases and speeding up the vaccine trials another approach to reduce the time between the start of different phases of the vaccine clinical trial process as much as possible so for example starting a phase 3 trial while a phase 2 trial is still ongoing and before it has yielded preliminary results or oh, this is one method that is compressing the testing phases and speeding up so simultaneously you will be conducting phase 2 and phase 3 and matching up clinical trials to where disease occurs and also if this particular trial is conducted in places where there is actually disease it will really help in order to find a proper solution to show that a vaccine is efficacy efficacious participants in phase 3 trials need to be exposed to the infection the vaccine is meant to prevent and that will really help so let us move on to the next topic the next topic is about epfo that is employed provident fund organization we need to understand this particular news article just in this perspective of the covid 19 and what the difficulties that has been faced during the covid 19 pandemic has led this epfo regarding the interest rate on how the pf deposits for 2019 20 is much different from 2020 2021 so in march 2020 the board of trustees of employees provident fund organization has fixed the interest rate on pf deposits for 2019 to 20 at 8.5 percent now the provident fund contributions collected by epfo is invested in equities and debt and returns from such investments is used to pay interest to pf subscribers now this particular interest rate was fixed at the start of the financial year keeping in mind the long term returns now however due to economic slowdown that is caused by covid-19 there is a fall in the stock market so hence epfo finds it difficult to sell its financial in- investments and earn adequate profits so on behalf of this particular incident the epfo has recommended splitting payments of the interest rates of 8.5 percentage recommended for the financial year 2019 to 2020 into two parts that is the epfo will credit 8.1 percentage to its over 6 crore subscribers for the year that means 8.15 will be given to 6 crore subscribers for year immediately and give the remaining 0.35 percentage before december 31 2020 so on behalf of this you need to understand what is epfo and epf now as an employee working in corporate setup there are several things one would like to know about employees provident fund so epf is the main scheme under the employees provident funds and miscellaneous provisions act of 1955 so it is a statutory bounded agency so this particular epf organization comes under employees provident funds and miscellaneous provisions act of 1952 and the scheme is managed under the aegis of employees provident fund organization so epf comes under a particular act and it is managed by employees provident fund organization it covers every establishment in which 20 or more people are employed and certain organizations are covered subject to certain conditions and exemptions are given if the employability is less than 20 persons each now under epf scheme an employee has to pay a certain contribution towards the scheme and an equal contribution is paid by the employer the employee gets a lump sum amount including self and employee's contribution with interest on both on retirement so he will be re- receiving what whatever lump sum amount regarding his own investment and the employee's contribution too so under epf scheme an employee has to pay a certain contribution towards the scheme and an equal contribution is paid by the employee that is clear and as per the rules in epf employee whose pay is more than 50000 a month at the time of joining is not eligible and is called non eligible employee the employees drawing less than rupees 15000 per month have to mandatorily become members of epf however an employee who is drawing pay above prescribed limit that is currently rupees 15000 can become a member with permission of assistant pf commissioner if he and his employers agree that's all about epf let us move on to the 
next important news it is regarding exploiting the chinese exit so it speaks about hyper regional solutions regarding the indian tech problems in prelims it is in economy section of the portion and it means as part of gs paper 3 the current india china border standoff has expanded watchful indian eyes into cyberspace but the chinese put up blinding shields on their own internal territory more than a decade ago because china already had a great internet wall and to that it has exerted censorship barriers to various companies and due to this lot of domestic industries popped up in china and that led to chinese boom in manufacturing sector all across the world and china already had banned several popular western websites and applications years ago so that's the reason why india can simply play or tweak with chinese economy or the chinese players because most of them are domestic based and not global based why chinese tech firms need access to indian market that is to be understood now with the rise of jio the response from its competitors the widening reach of internet connection across the country will provide millions of millions of non urban indians with access to internet and now india has the lowest internet data cost in the world in its attempt to dominate the rest of the world the chinese industry that is internet industry desperately needs india's freshly minted 500 plus million netizens to continue to act as a training ground for a algorithms they put together so china need indian population to experiment here the china's internet ecosystem is entirely self created and it is self run and self serviced yet it exports the newly banned apps such as tiktok and pubg worldwide so that is to be remembered so these apps which have a lot of subscribers are being manufactured and developed in china so in that case these chinese apps are really self sufficient they are self created they have a better economy worldwide and they are adding to the user base of 900 plus million chinese netizens whose data they already have exclusive access to so there is about 900 plus million chinese netizens who are using these apps and also the primary indian objective should be to shift from servicing others to providing for ourselves that means if china is embedding these kind of technologies we need to look into how we can provide domestic support to our entrepreneurs in order to develop new and well defined apps so in the absence of chinese tech the indian entrepreneurs should not simply look to replace what the existing firms have so far be providing so we need to look for other kinds of solution rather than trying to mimic what the existing firms in india is trying to do or was trying to do so these people were trying to make quality products that was global in nature but we should shift our perspective and we should focus instead on providing services and products of high quality